Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the Commonwealth Club of California. You can find us online at commonwealthclub.org, on Facebook and Twitter, and on our YouTube channel. My name is Ken Broad. I'm with Jackson Square Partners, an asset management firm here in San Francisco that is proud to be supporting tonight's program. Joining us this evening is Dr. Neil Ferguson, the Milbank Family Senior Fellow at Stanford University's Hoover Institution. He is an Oxford-educated, award-winning international economist and historian who's well-known for both his academic contributions and outspoken political commentary. Dr. Ferguson has published numerous books to critical acclaim and has been featured in several documentaries. In his new book, The Square and the Tower, Networks and Power, From the Freemasons to Facebook, Dr. Ferguson argues that it's networks of people, not individuals, who shape the future and create change. Dr. Ferguson takes us on a whirlwind tour through history, from the Illuminati to Twitter, highlighting the perennial tension between powerful hierarchies and distributed networks. Will the new network platforms deliver libertarian utopia and free us from the shackles of the administrative state, or result in violent populist upheavals reminiscent of the French Revolution? Joining Dr. Ferguson on stage is tonight's program moderator, Quentin Hardy. Quentin is currently the head of editorial at Google Cloud, with previous stints at the New York Times and Forbes magazine. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Neil Ferguson and Quentin Hardy to the Commonwealth Club stage. Well, thank you, Kenneth, very much for that welcome. Um, For what's supposed to be the past, history's been very busy in our time. From traditional telling about kings and empires, we've seen Marxist histories that focus on conflicts among different social and economic groups. We've seen feminist history, hidden histories of marginalized groups, intersexual, <laughs> excuse me, intersectional history. <laughs> big history, got that out of the way. Big history that walks us from the Big Bang to the latest tweet, counterfactuals, and so forth. Into this mix, Neil Ferguson, a prolific author who passionately believes history lives and informs, is taking something of a new tack and one very much of our times. Inspired by his studies of information, natural networks in, in nature, and Henry Kissinger's personal networks, his new book, The Square and the Tower, looks at history as a series of network lattices of information and power. The tower of the title is a traditional hierarchy of government, of church, of a military. The square is the less organized but often more fateful system of social and information sharing relationships beyond all manner of social, intellectual, and political revolutions. For those of you who still think social networks began with Facebook and ended with Twitter, it will come as a shock to learn that social networks played key roles in the rise of Christianity, the rise of capitalism in the Renaissance, the birth of science and the Enlightenment, and so on through our own time. For me, it made for a heck of a read. But as I said, Professor Ferguson believes that history teaches. In particular, he sees lessons from the rise of the printing press and the social turmoil that ultimately traumatized and remade the European world to what's going on now, particularly here in the Silicon Valley. There is elsewhere, a rising social network created all sorts of conflicts for the more stable networked hierarchy. Today's information revolution, he says, has overthrown huge industries, enabled fast-moving terror groups, organized Arab Spring, hijacked democracy in many elections, and it's just getting started. How our established hierarchies respond to this will be a great part of our discussion tonight. Neil, thanks very much for joining us. I'd like to begin by asking you, um, well, you seem to think we are living in the curse of interesting times very much, um, and this is really one of the great watersheds in history. Now, your training is to go against that and to look out for people who say this is so important. What led you to such a important conclusion? I was uh, kind of shocked when I got to Stanford, which is nearly a year and a half ago, and had my first uh, up close and personal encounters with Silicon Valley to find that most people there thought history began with the Google IPO. 
<laughs> and everything before that was the Stone Age, about which nothing of interest could be said. And uh, so part of my motive in writing this book was, uh, as Eric Schmidt put it, to teach Silicon Valley a history lesson, and in particular to show that, that social networks hadn't been invented by Mark Zuckerberg, uh, that in fact one could understand uh, the whole of human history uh, using this framework of, of tension and interaction between uh, hierarchies and, and networks, towers and squares. I think the key way of understanding the present, which is far more effective than abstract mathematical models, is by analogy. What is this like? And that's the question that I go through life asking. What is our time like? Uh, because when you hear on the news that something is unprecedented, and you can hear that more or less nightly, uh, what that means is that the person speaking knows no history. Now, if you know no <laughs> history, everything is unprecedented. Of course it is. Um, uh, and, and the only kind of uh, subgroup is the people who know only the 1930s, for whom everything is like the 1930s, whatever it is. And my, my sense is that this is completely not like the 1930s. We have to go back to understand our time a lot further. We have to go back about 500 years to, to a time when a new technology, the printing press, profoundly changed the European public sphere so much that Martin Luther could mount a challenge to the extraordinarily powerful uh, hierarchy of the Roman Catholic Church and avoid being destroyed as a heretic, which he certainly would have been had it not been for the printing press. The printing press allowed Luther's message to go viral, as we would now say, to spread all over Europe, and a, a new kind of social network very rapidly formed of people who basically agreed with him. So for me, the starting point of the book was that analogy, that we are at, the relative, at a relatively early stage of a similar process to that which began with the advent of printing in Europe. Our public sphere has been as revolutionized by the internet, by the personal computer, and now the smartphone, as the European public sphere was revolutionized by the, by the printing press. And we need to learn from that history what the pitfalls are of a more networked society. That was really what motivated me to write the book. The parallels can be quite chilling because um, the advent of print slowed the development of language, and what Luther did in translating the Bible was to take literally the word of God and put it in your tongue. That, fast forward a couple of centuries, is the seeds of nationalism, where being a French speaker becomes an interesting form of identity and you evolve this myth that we've always been French speakers, we've always been here, that's something worth fighting and dying for. And now we seem to have this new transnational ad hoc technology, very data-driven, um, very powerful, very emotional in, its, in a way. Does it threaten the nation state, ultimately, the way the Catholic Church was threatened? The but church didn't go away, but it had to accommodate these forces. Potentially, uh, in the sense that what happened in the 16th century was not what Luther expected. Luther thought if it were possible to mass produce Bibles and other religious uh, texts in the vernacular, uh, you would get a step closer to the priesthood of all believers, which the Bible talks about. And the vision was a rather utopian one. If everybody could have a direct relationship to Scripture and therefore to God, then you wouldn't have this intermediating corrupt clergy uh, against which uh, uh, Luther had, had invade. Well, we didn't see that at all. What in fact happened in, in Europe was something that was predictable uh, on the basis of network science. Those people who've written the sociology of networks have long understood that even relatively small networks tend to polarize. They tend to cluster uh, according to the, the principle of homophily, a word that one doesn't hear terribly often on, on network TV. But uh, if you know the idea of birds of a feather flock together, you know what homophily means. People congregate together in like-minded or otherwise like groups. 
That's exactly what happened in Europe once the Reformation got underway. The people who agreed with Luther uh, became Protestants. The only problem Luther had was that a good many of them said, you haven't gone nearly far enough. And so you not only had a Protestant cluster, but it tended to, to move uh, to a kind of more extreme critique uh, of Catholicism as it was practiced. Those who disagreed with Luther said, absolutely not, we must resist this, we need a counter-reformation. And very quickly, instead of a priesthood of all believers, Luther had unleashed 130 years of religious conflict uh, in Europe that in t at times became extraordinarily bloody. I think that is a key lesson for our times too. Those who thought that they could create a global community when everybody would be connected, then everything would be awesome. I mean, that's essentially the message that we've got. I was going to say your analogy wasn't filling me with joy because I don't Luther want to thought this was happening. The 2016 election was not exactly what I, 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 anybody I, out here thought. I come, bearing, I come bearing bad news. Uh, once everybody is connected, it won't be really awesome. Uh, it's already pretty bad with about a third of the planet connected. And, uh, you know, look at what happened. It wasn't, there are good things too. Oh, no, I don't want to come across as a Luddite here. This is not a Luddite book. I make it very clear, Quentin, that much of the creativity uh, of the West was unlocked by the printing press and the Reformation, because pretty soon you had the scientific revolution, then came the Enlightenment. Most of the good ideas of modernity came from these networks of intellectuals and scholars uh, trading ideas, not only in the printed word, but often in the written word. And, and that's part of the excitement of this subject. You realize the extent to which the great breakthroughs in human knowledge, including the Industrial Revolution, as we were just talking about in the, in the green room, didn't come from heroic individuals, but from networks of innovators, uh, whether in the realm of technology or of, of philosophy. That's the good news. Uh, but the bad news is uh, that social networks, uh, even if they're very high-minded, have these, uh, I think, inherent negative properties. The polarization is one, and I think we can see in our own time the extent to which creating online social networks that now include a really high proportion of Americans has not created a wonderful sense of community. It has intensified an already growing polarization. And one can see this if one looks at the network structure uh, of Twitter users uh, or indeed Facebook users. There are these clusters one conservative, one liberal, they're extraordinarily separate from one another. In high information environments like this where new stuff is calling at you all the time, there's a lot of money in reassuring people that their worldview doesn't have to change. And the algorithms, of course, are designed to give people more of what they like. Mm. More of what you engaged with yesterday is coming your way tomorrow, I can promise it. And that, that I think we all now pretty much understand. I heard former President Obama talking about uh, filter bubbles, uh, echo chambers. Uh, that's becoming conventional wisdom, but let's just think about what that implies. I think what that implies is that the 1990s or even 2000s vision of a wonderful global community, we'd all get together and share cat videos. That vision was a complete delusion. You had to ignore not only history, but network science to believe that we would all just be in one happy cluster. Uh, the reality was that polarization was always likely, and I hope the book shows why the exact same thing happened once it was possible to communicate ideas much faster than before through the printing press. Broadly speaking, the printing press has the same kind of effect wow. as the personal computer does in terms of its impact on the, the price and volume Ultimately, of information sharing. it changes epistemology. Right. People start to think about the world differently. And unless you're comfortable with that, unless you're steering it, it can be extremely traumatic. The Thirty Years' War. Right. You know. the, da um, the danger here, and I don't want to be you know, excessively alarmist, but I think the danger here is that we don't see, I don't see anyway, a way of stopping this polarization from continuing. As long as the algorithms are doing what they do, it seems to me that we are bound to grow further apart. I mean, I read a paper after I, I published the book, which really made me sit up, and the paper showed that on political issues, a tweet was 20% more likely to be retweeted for every moral or emotive word that it used. 
And the incentive, therefore, if you're interested in being retweeted, is always to use strong language. Mm. Uh, and any of you who are on Twitter will know how often that is the case. So I think we have actually set up something of a polarization machine uh, that is going to continue to drive us apart unless we fundamentally rethink the way in which the network platforms operate. Yeah, I mean, um, among the small challenges, creating an education system where people enjoy and feel rewarded by the tension of encountering difference. Right. I, mean, I can think of well a few campuses where that is definitely right. not, well, uh, the prevailing Well, up, and, up and down in society. I mean, yeah. and at the elite level, at least there's a reward for finding out you're wrong and being right. The system really doesn't reward people below that. I mean, some of the smartest guys I know say, I love being wrong. It means I'm about to learn something. But yeah. for normal people, it's stressful. Try, you know, try being wrong on social media or on network TV. Right. It is shame culture. It, it is so un unpleasant that an incentive has been created for public intellectuals never to admit that they're wrong. No. And I can think of a few, I won't name them, who you know, make a virtue of their consistency airbrushing out their errors yeah. of the past. And if you do say, I was wrong, there's a kind of howl of That's indignation, so uh, which, which discourages, I think, intellectual honesty. I certainly see a lot of intelligent uh, uh, colleagues retreating ever further from the public sphere because they just don't want to get into this mud wrestling competition. Well, it's so unfortunate. One of the most memorable and entertaining things I've ever seen in Congress was a scientist testifying, and a congressman said to him, you used to say this, and now you say this. And he looked at him and said, I changed my mind. Well, it was John it was Maynard Keynes. He impossible. said, when the facts change, I change my mind. Right. What do you do, sir? Now, Great question. This is a good segue, because for those who thought you're a vicious free market capitalist, red in tooth and claw, you seem to be quite concerned about the immense concentration of wealth at the highest level here. And you think that's also contributing to some of our dilemma. Absolutely. One of the paradoxes of the networked world is that we were promised greater equality. We were all going to be netizens <coughs> and we were all going to be able to speak truth to power or at least share cat videos. And it turns out that the structure of the networks that have been created online is anything but egalitarian. Uh, this turns out to be inherent again in, in the way that social networks form. As people join a network, the phenomenon of preferential attachment leads them to want to be connected to the people who are already really well connected. Uh, and that is why some people end up having millions of, of Twitter followers and other, other people end up having hardly any. Mm. Uh, this is the, the characteristic structure of, of a social network. It, it's governed by a power law, or it's scale-free, to use the language that the physicist Laszlo Barabasi has used. We therefore have this paradox. We, we were promised a kind of democratization. But in reality, the networks that have been created are anything but flat. Uh, and moreover, ownership of network platforms is extraordinarily concentrated, as I hardly need to tell an audience in San Francisco. that The founders of the network platforms have become fantastically wealthy. The users, mm, not so much because we gave them all our data for free. And it's not, uh, it's not uh, just the big bucks. It's not just the wealth. There's a really interesting evolution, probably since financial deregulation in the 70s, of a kind of transnational class that you used to first meet with bankers. When I was in Japan, I'd meet these guys, and they'd say, oh, I saw Fred in London, and I'm seeing right. Barbara you know, in Switzerland. They all, They're all in Switzerland they at all, the moment. They're all at Davos. Well, right. And they knew each other better than they knew any of the locals. It was always notable. But now in the Valley, um, a couple years ago, I was with, this is going to sound like a joke, I was with an American and a Romanian and a Czech. <laughs> and I said, if I threw down a German passport and a Canadian passport and an Australian passport, would you even care which one you picked up? They all said no. My kid's not going to do national service. I do my business on the internet. I see my friends at the TED Talks. And the class of transnationals has vastly increased. The rise of Bitcoin is interesting where that's concerned. They champion this currency that has no central bank. So the promise was distributed networks, decentralization, the, the libertarian promise offered a great 
a great deal. But what ends up happening, and I think this is one of the key findings of the book, is that the existing inequalities that the market economy generates if it's left to itself without great disruptions like world wars has been magnified by the advent of, of network economics. I, I read a terrific e economics paper as I was writing the book that for me was an aha moment. The, the paper argues that in, in the past, networks were essentially uh, nepotistic, hereditary networks based on, on inherited privilege and status. And the market economy came along and essentially eroded those networks of privilege and status. That's essentially the story of the rise of capitalism in a nutshell. The problem has been that we, we then got rid of those old elites and created new elites based on uh, capitalism and the accumulation of wealth. And then we have overlaid a new structure on top of that that's network-based. And that has magnified the existing inequalities of income and wealth in ways that I think are, are profoundly disruptive. Quentin, you asked a question about, about the fabric of the nation state. It's not easily, I think, sustainable, that notion of, of a universal national citizenship when the inequalities become as glaring as they've become. And I, I don't think that it's uh, in any way at odds with a belief in, in the market, which I certainly have as superior to state planning, to recognize that we are dealing with an unsustainable uh, level of inequality. I uh, certainly in some nation states that will make it challenging to maintain a common, any sense of common identity. And, and, the, and the social networks seem to me to make that worse. Again, there is a, a lesson from the great history of print because print got kick-started because a couple things happened in the background that really were completely exogenous but feathered in. The fall of Constantinople flooded Europe with new texts and there was interest. The New World created all these documents about the New World. Columbus's memoirs or diary of going to the New World was pirated 10 times in two years after it came out. It flooded Europe and it was translated and there was this industry of translation. So there are these things that ride in with it. And in this case, I think what you're saying resonates very well with things like the end of national service, um, hyper-marketing to individuals or certain income groups. Do you buy your groceries at Whole Foods? Do you buy your groceries at Costco and Sam's Club? It gets harder and harder to encounter people who aren't like yourself. That's right. And that's not healthy for a democracy. And so somewhere in the system, if the democracy is going to flourish, People have to find healthy ways to encounter difference, to change their minds, um, to have some sort of social encounters with people who aren't like themselves, and yet that's healthy and endorsed. Tall order, yeah? It's a very tall order at the moment. And as I said, I think the way that I we have Google Cloud things we're doing that are going to help, but this isn't an advertisement. <laughs> I'm always being reassured by the, the big tech companies that they're going to do wonderful things that will fix it all. Like, we're going to tweak the algorithm. The news feed is going to look different. A collapse Leave it cost, to us. The collapse the of the cost of computing will do wonderful things, but this is your show, not mine. <laughs> I, uh, you know, I wish you luck in this endeavor. I think it's... Uh, <laughs> My man. I, I, think, I think we have to recognize the, the fact that, that companies that, that are primarily motivated uh, by the need to keep the advertising revenues flowing in are not likely to make the choices that will be best for our society. Mm -hmm. We are in a very paradoxical situation. It's hard to make them shop when you're stressing them out. I, I, you know, yeah, and I think ultimately, so long as uh, uh, Google and Facebook and the others have to show the people paying uh, uh, their advertising revenues, we have high user engagement keep paying us, the priority is not going to be uh, truth uh, or indeed social stability. The priority is clearly going to be user engagement. And user engagement, as we know, uh, is generated not necessarily by true content, but very often by fake content. And it, I put it like this, fake news and extreme views. And these are the things that, are, that we are incentivized by the algorithms to consume because these are the things that we are engaged by. 
The Pope endorses Donald Trump was a great story. It got an enormous amount of user engagement in 2016. It just happened to be untrue. Uh, <laughs> So I, I'm, I'm going to push you know, back I'm, a little I, bit. Yeah, I want you to. I'm provoking you. But I do, I do think that... You are. It's, I do think good. we have a paradoxical situation where comp there are companies now, and Google is one of them and you work for them, that know <laughs> more about the citizens of this country than the government. Maybe that's a good thing. But I think know more about them than the citizens themselves. That's a very new state of affairs. That old line, with great power comes great responsibility, seems to me appropriate here. I think the United States is still sleepwalking uh, towards a more polarized future because we haven't really come to terms with the extent of the power that your company and Facebook has accumulated. And I don't even think you meant to. I don't even think Mark well, Zuckerberg was, meant to do this. First, but it's happened. First pushback, that is to say, when we talk about you know, tech companies have too much power. One tends to think of a William Randolph Hearst starting the Spanish-American War. Do you really think Mark Zuckerberg and Larry Page and all the rest of them thought, Pepe the Frog, the 2016 election, let's go? I don't. Well, number one. And I think there are many good things inside this, like the Khan Academy, that can help educate people and help them encounter a healthier environment. I, I don't dispute that the Khan Academy is a good thing, and, and Wikipedia too, for that matter. But here's the thing. William Randolph Hearst never had as big a share of the news market in the United States as Mark Zuckerberg does today. 45% of Americans get their news from Facebook. Hearst never got close to that share. Now, nobody sat in Facebook saying, how can we help Trump, except the people that went and helped Trump, except the employees who went and worked with Brad Pascal, Trump's digital uh, guy, to make sure that the targeted adverts hit the right demographics. And I fear that it's still not fully sunk in, but let me say it now. No Facebook, no Trump. He would not have won. I'm absolutely sure in 2016, if it had not been for the way in which the network platforms, not only Facebook, also uh, uh, Twitter and to an extent Google, helped. If you take away those network platforms and imagine the 2016 election without them, I'm not even sure he would have got the nomination of the Republican Party. I'm absolutely sure he would have lost. She outspent him two to one. In conventional media terms, he wouldn't have made it. So I think Silicon Valley is still struggling to come to terms with the reality that the tools they built, which it was generally assumed were liberal weapons, because Obama had been the first person really to use them, turned out to be the secret weapons of Trump's populist insurgency. The heads have been exploding since November the 9th, 2016. More importantly, the truth has gradually emerged of the extent to which for example, the Russians were able to use the network platforms, and I still feel we've got more to learn about that. Well, as you were saying before, Trump is a problematic character in all this for you because, yes, no Trumps, no network, but no, net, no Trump, plenty of networks still. Sure. This is not an anomaly. This, you can normalize this or not normalize this or feel any way you want about it, but this is the world that is. This, is, so. this change in the public sphere has fundamentally altered democracy in the sense that from now on, and this has been true since 2016, elections are going to be between people who understand how to use these tools and conventional po politicians who don't yet get it. And I think watch closely the elections that are coming up uh, this year in Brazil, in Mexico, in Italy, uh, because I, I see nothing that has changed that prevents the same games being played as were being played in the United States in 2016, and also in Britain, because in some ways Brexit was a kind of dry run for all of this. The Leave campaign won the Brexit referendum because they understood the power of Facebook advertising, and unfortunately David Cameron and George Osborne didn't. Mm. Um, we have some questions from the audience, one of which is a excellent segue from a question I wanted to ask you about your pioneering work in Kissinger studies mm. and the ways in which looking at Henry Kissinger um, affected your understanding of networks, in particular social and political networks. Footnote, did you see Kissinger was in the New Yorker this week as the person who recommended to China that they target Jared Kushner and talk to Jared more than anyone? His network is still in play. 
It sure is. And if you've read Michael Wolff's uh, book, you'll notice that he pops up there too. <laughs> the, the reason I wrote this book, uh, quite apart from my general desire to, to teach Silicon Valley a history lesson, was partly to think more about networks with a view to volume two of Kissinger. Volume one of Kissinger is essentially a, a kind of intellectual biography of someone who goes from being a refugee to being a, a, a public intellectual. And, and it was a biography focusing on, on his thought, really, more than his relationships. But volume two, which I'm about to get to work on in earnest, has to be about his network. Because you only, I think, you could only explain Kissinger's, asc Kissinger's ascendancy in the 1970s, his rapid rise from being this obscure professor that that Nixon had appointed to everybody's surprise, to being really the, the, the second most powerful person in uh, the government by, by 73, by looking at the way that he networked. So the hypothesis for volume two is it was his network and his networking that transformed his role from that of public intellectual to major player in <coughs> government and indeed in the world. So I thought, if I'm going to write that, if I'm going to pull that off, or at least to test the hypothesis, I need to understand better this network business. So I thought, I better teach myself how networks work. The One Square in the Tower is really an attempt to do that. And in it, if you're interested, in, as your questioner is, in, in Kissinger studies, there is a kind of trailer, because I, I sat down and I did some initial work on the Kissinger network to try and establish whether the hypothesis had any real merit. And it's, it's, looking, it's looking promising. One of, one of the interesting things I found about that was um, how his network cross-cut. And he attached himself to celebrity almost instinctively, or maybe it spoke to him. And, I mean, celebrity had been a factor in politics ever since Edward Bernays landed the Coolidge account. Yeah. But he took it to a new level in the 70s. Yeah, the way I put it is, in the 1970s, something fundamentally shifted. The mid-20th century was the zenith of hierarchical structures of government that really had been the, the characteristic feature of governments, both totalitarian and democratic, in the 1940s. And that lingered on in the 50s and 60s to a degree. But by the 1970s, it's really impossible to keep the imperial presidency running on the basis that it had run under Eisenhower, or for that matter, Kennedy. And I think what's fascinating is that Kissinger understood that there was a transition happening from the hierarchical world of the mid-20th century to a world of what he called interdependence. So he doesn't just deal with people in the org chart. Remember, there's a real contrast, and it's probably relevant to all of your lives, between the experience as depicted in the org chart, you're in a pyramid, you're somewhere in the pyramid, there's someone right at the top, uh, but you're basically defined by whom you report to and who reports to you. Now, that was the kind of mid-20th century way of thinking about organization. And to most politicians in the early 1970s, that was still how they thought about the federal government. It was this big pyramid, and at the top of it was Richard Nixon. Kissinger somehow knew that you had to get out of that paradigm and into the paradigm of networks. So as you rightly say, he's not just interacting with people in the government. He's interacting with people in the media. He's interacting with people in Hollywood. He's interacting with people in, uh, in all kinds of foreign governments. That's partly his job as national security advisor. But really, no previous national security advisor or secretary of state had been that plugged into a global network. He's just a fantastic connoisseur of power in all fields. I think he understood that power was changing in its nature. And that, I think, is going to be one of the big themes of volume two. And, and the network approach will help me to formalize that that hypothesis and see if it, it really works. My hunch is that it does, and it will give a kind of di completely different feel to the second volume. And then the questioner wonders, so as we think about networks, have you deprecated the great man theory? What does this mean about a Churchill or a Stalin or a Lincoln or a Freud or a Marx? Well, I've, I think any serious historian knows that, that not everything can be explained in terms of great or, for that matter, terrible men. And I sometimes think that our, our media have collectively forgotten this uh, in the past year because we essentially live uh, in this world in which all that really matters is the personality of the president. And we obsessively discuss this. Uh, nothing that I have learned from the study of history over the last 30 or so years 
uh, leads me to believe that that is the right framework to understand the politics of a modern uh, democracy. The I'm structure sure. of politics is the really important thing one has to understand as well. I mean, I've never written anything that's been entirely structuralist. I've, I've written about the incredible mistakes that were made by statesmen in 1914, and I've written about some of the, the extraordinary uh, important and successful decisions that were taken in 1939-40, some of which are now immortalized on the silver screen uh, in in the, the movie about Churchill that, that everyone's talking about. So I'm not somebody who says it's all structure, it's not personality. But I think one has, as a historian, to strike a balance between the role of individuals uh, and the structures within which they operate. And the Founding Fathers designed the United States of America to be almost the antidote to the great man theory. They didn't really want great men running the United States. They well understood, because they'd studied history and they'd studied classical political theory, that the most likely outcome for a republic with democratic elements was its descent into tyranny. But exactly that happened in France. The United States has avoided that fate precisely because the power of the president is circumscribed. And I keep trying to tell people it doesn't matter as much as you keep saying what the personality of the president is. However awful you may find him, and I certainly find many things about Donald Trump quite awful, that's not the most important thing about American politics. And, and I do feel as if we've forgotten that in a kind of terrible man theory of history. I don't think we're prevails. really in either or country here anyway, because no. um, if we pay attention to nature or biology or social networks, whatever the network, one of the key valences is the passage and collection of information. And in the case of Churchill or Lincoln or Freud, these are very effective communicators and they're very well connected and they can sway people. Right. And in the case of Stalin, you have the anti, the man who can prevent information from flowing and right. shepherds it in and almost creates his image by halting information and allowing people to parrot false information in a crowd. So the great note man theory becomes the great node theory. Right. And, and, and I write about Stalin because in some ways Stalin is the supreme example uh, of a system of government in which power was completely centralized. And one man had the ability somehow to monitor every conversation that was happening. I tell the story of Isaiah Berlin's meeting with Anna Akhmatova. It's an extraordinary moving story. Uh, these two intellectuals meet. They have really one, one night of intense scholarly uh, engagement uh, in her apartment in, in Leningrad. And, and Stalin gets to hear of it because Stalin gets to hear of everything and resumes his persecution of Akhmatova and her family for the simple offense of having a conversation uh, with a British citizen that wasn't authorized by the state. So in Stalin's Soviet Union, you have the supreme hierarchical structure in which one node, if you want to use the terminology of networks, you're all nodes, by the way. Just to be clear, everyone in here is a node, including the two people on the stage. Uh, and we could graph the social network here if Mark Zuckerberg would give us your data. And we could find out, we could find out who was really well connected and how many, who had the most edges you know, who had the highest degree centrality. We could figure all that out. It'd be fascinating. Uh, he won't give us the data, so we won't be able to do it. But oh that's my. essentially uh, what we're talking about here. If you imagine the network architecture of the Soviet Union under Stalin, there's this one node that every piece of information has to go to. And if it doesn't, you risk, as one of the lower nodes, being taken out, mm. sent to a labor camp, or put in front of a firing squad. Yes, and you say that um, Berlin's experience of witnessing what happened to Akhmatova, it caused him to do his best work in defense of individual freedom against historical determinism. Right. I underlined that because this idea of patterns and networks guiding things, does it become a kind of historical determinism? Are we in a position to change where we are now and make it better? It's not deterministic. I've been a, an anti-determinist all my career, going all the way back to, to virtual history. Uh, I think we need to escape from the notion that there are inexorable historical forces driving us uh, in directions we can't change. And Neil I, just told you not to give up. Don't give up, because you know it, 
ultimately the, the, the pathologies of, of online social networks in the age of, of populist politics are fixable. We're not powerless here. But I do think that, to go back to an earlier point, we'll, burn, we'll be naive if we just trust in Chairman Zuck to fix the algorithm and uh, it'll all be fine. I don't actually think that that's a plausible scenario. Ultimately, uh, there are issues of regulation that need to be addressed. Normally, uh, uh, people who are seen as I frequently am as conservative, I'm just a classical liberal, but in many parts of the world now, that's regarded as conservative. The Normally, <laughs> the language is broken. It's, it, it's true that the word liberal has become almost wholly useless for that reason. But if you are a classical liberal, you don't like to talk about regulation. Uh, but if you think about the regulatory situation we find ourselves in, it's completely anomalous. Because under mid-1990s legislation, the network platforms are essentially exempt uh, from any liability for the content that appears in their, their platforms. Uh, and that's this famous uh, Title 230 of the Communications and Decency Act, whereas conventional publishers have liability. Uh, and we have, in that sense, an unlevel playing field in the realm of content publishing. I think that has to change so that they are liable for the content that appears. Sorry, you too. And I think that's the single one change that I would urge us all to think about. Antitrust ain't going to save you. Here the good, here's the good news for Google. I am not proposing the breakup of Google. Uh, I'm not proposing that we do to Facebook what was done to Standard Oil. I don't think that will work for reasons that we can go into if you're interested. But I do think we can ensure that there's a level playing field and we can stop the pretense that Facebook is not the biggest content publisher in the world. We can stop the pretense that it's just a technology company and oh, well, there's some content, but it's nothing to do with us. I think well, that, that pass has been sold and we should, we should make that clear and remedy the regulatory framework accordingly. So no, there is no great deterministic force that, that condemns us to an increasingly polarized society. But we can't be passive here. There does need to be some meaningful change and I don't think we should just rely on the good intentions uh, of the giants of Silicon Valley. I don't think they see that as their job either, to tell you the truth. Um, but it's well, as I that. said, I know what their job is, which is to generate uh, shareholder value. Uh, their giant publicly quoted companies, billions of dollars of revenue have to come in every quarter, or I hate to think what markets might do. That's fair enough. That's the way the system works. Well, as I said, but the, the regulatory framework needs to be consistent, and there's a huge inconsistency in it now, which I think needs to be addressed. Yeah. Um, let's talk about solutions a little bit, because the conclusion of the book puts me in this very interesting place. You say, technology has enormously empowered networks of all kinds relative to traditional hierarchical power structures. But the consequence of that change will be determined by the structures, emergent properties, and interactions of those networks. And I wrote under that, so are we screwed. But you just cleared me up on that, and we're not. <laughs> I That's think good. We, I think we, we run the risk of being screwed, but I, I don't want us to abandon all hope. I think the, the first... Uh, a necessary precondition for fixing these problems is to identify the nature of the problem. As long as we think the problem is that the president has a warped personality, we're going nowhere. We need to understand that something much more profound is amiss that has to do with the structure of politics and of the public sphere. And he is a product of that. Well, and had he not existed, I have no doubt that some other populist demagogue with a large TV audience would have seized the opportunity, just as similar people are seizing these opportunities in different countries. And I think that's your message more than Silicon Valley is going to have to figure this out. You know, in 1510, the Catholic Church held its first book burning. Seven years before <laughs> Luther showed up, yeah. they didn't realize the train had left the station and you couldn't control right. print the way you could control yeah. manuscript. Yeah. It's not clear to me that the existing hierarchies in this country or in Europe are fully aware of what time it is and what needs to be done. Absolutely. You seem to have a lot of time for China and feel they well, control it pretty well, but they did that by stiff arming the Western companies and building their own versions that they control. The Chinese story is amazing. I mean, I, don't, I, I have a lot of time for the Chinese in the sense that they figured this out in a way that the Europeans completely failed to. They realized that if they allowed the American technology companies in, as the Europeans did, then pretty quickly they would lose, uh, they would lose control. 
and they would find themselves having to do what the Europeans do, which is essentially try to regulate and tax American companies. The Chinese said, no, we're not going to do that. We're going to allow our own uh, network platforms to emerge, Baidu, Alibaba, Tencent in particular. And the result from a Chinese vantage point was an enormous strategic success, not least because the Chinese Communist Party now has access on demand to the big data about its citizens. That is power beyond the dreams of any previous one-party state. Joe Stalin would give his eye teeth. Right. I mean, can you imagine what they could have done with that kind of knowledge in Nazi Germany? So I think from a Chinese vantage point, this is a, an, a consistent solution to the problem posed by online social networks. I don't like it. I would hate to live in a world that was like that because we would essentially find our, our data at the disposal of Xi Jinping. But you have to admit that it's, it's internally consistent, whereas I think we are in a much less consistent uh, situation. And I agree with something you, you just said, Quentin. I think it's more that people in, in Washington don't really understand this. They are so behind the curve, it's kind of amazing. Uh, so my sense is that the learning process is still at a relatively early stage there. Uh, and that it will take time. It may take another scandalous election, another contested election to force people in Washington to address the kind of issues that I talk about in the book. What's that Upton Sinclair line? It's hard to convince a man of something when his livelihood depends on believing the opposite. And there's a lot of people whose livelihoods do depend on believing that everything is okay, everything is awesome. Well, there's a more troubling question under that. You feel you may not like the type of government China has, but you nod to its efficacy and how they're addressing the problem. And what the Russians appear to be doing in many countries um, is very accretive to Russian power because they're creating a broad cynicism about democracy which allows for authoritarianism and legitimizes authoritarian states. Is democracy um, in a bad place in this kind of a formula? Well, it's vulnerable. I mean, I'm not one of those people who, who thinks that democracy is about to die. I don't think the data bear that, that story out. But I do think that it's, it's vulnerable, and the Russians in particular have understood how to exploit those vulnerabilities. Uh, from a position of weakness, Russian military doctrine quickly evolved the, uh, the theory that you could use the, the networked structure of Western societies uh, to your advantage. Uh, and this has really been disruption of a superpower on the cheap, but it has been very effective as a delegitimization strategy to sow doubts in people's minds about a system that was already somewhat struggling to maintain its legitimacy. And if you, if you look at measures of public trust in institutions, uh, I think that's a pretty good measure of the problem we have. Public confidence in legislatures, look at the uh, approval rating of Congress, is low. And the Russians seem intent on lowering it further. And not only here, this is certainly a global strategy, and they have been, they tried it with less success in Europe last year, but they certainly have not given up. And I do think that we need to be far more, A, vigilant, uh, and, and B, aggressive in response than we've been. Because in the end, I, I don't see much sign of deterrence working here. One possibility which I discuss in the book is that deterrence can't work in the realm of cyber warfare because it's an, an incessant war that is going on all the time and return addresses are difficult to find. If that's right, then we've got to think again about how to deal with this threat. I, so, I see no sign of the Russians stopping doing this. If anything, they have seen that it works and they're incentivized to do more. Though it's worth adding, without, I don't want to exaggerate the evil genius of, of Vladimir Putin, it did kind of backfire on them in a way that I don't think that they uh, anticipated. Because if the goal was uh, to end up with an easing of sanctions, the very opposite has happened. They overplayed the hand. They did. I think they did. I think partly they didn't realize that they might, uh, they might actually end up with Trump as president. I don't think that was... Uh, that was factored I'm in. I'm not sure a lot of people were counting on that one. Well, almost almost nobody, and and including it, if Michael Wolff's to be believed, the campaign uh, the himself. The campaign itself. <laughs> uh, 
excluding yeah. maybe Bannon. So I, I, I mean, I think one shouldn't exaggerate the evil genius here, but it's clear that the techniques that have been deployed, not only in the United States, but in other countries, are still available. They can still do this stuff. And you may be pointing out an interesting and troubling characteristic of networks, be it the Arab Spring, Al-Qaeda, ISIS, um, any number of things. Um, these kind of ad hoc networks appear to be very good at something quick, usually something that says no, but they haven't proven very effective in building up positive outcomes unless there's some steering framework. Like a wi Jimmy Wales said about Wikipedia, it works because everybody knows what an encyclopedia is. But when it comes for these, to these new networks to have a sustained, powerful, successful new organization, nothing showed up very well yet, has it? And this is sort of in praise of hierarchies. Moving fast and, and breaking things is not just uh, a Facebook slogan. I think uh, Islamic State uh, has uh, moved fast and broken things. Uh, moving fast and breaking things is, is something that networks can do quite easily. And they may not feel any responsibility to put a new architecture in, in place. I'm very skeptical about the notion that we can run the world on the basis of distributed networks. I, I think that's an illusion and, it, and a dangerous illusion. Ultimately, you're not gonna solve the major problems that confront us, including uh, cyber warfare and cyber terrorism with a hashtag and a Facebook uh, or, or Google group. You ultimately are gonna need to have some hierarchical structure uh, to the international order, and the book concludes with, with a reflection, really, on, on the lessons of the last network age as it came to its end. I mean, the network age that we talked about at the beginning, which kind of got going with the Reformation, carried right on through to the end of the 18th century with one networked revolution after another. But ultimately, in the French Revolution, things went so haywire that... Uh, that an individual was able credibly to say, I alone can fix this, and that was, of course, Napoleon. From pretty much that moment on, the pendulum swung in the other direction, in the direction of, of hierarchical structures. And what's fascinating is to look at the way in which the international order after Napoleon was restructured with a very clear hierarchical principle. At the Congress of Vienna, the Congress they of start Vienna. declaring some rules. And they say, here's the rules. There are five great powers. Everybody else is not a great power. Get, get over it. Sorry, Sweden. Sorry, Spain. And the five great powers, in fact, and I don't think this is a, an out-of-consensus view, do a pretty good job over 100 years of avoiding a really major conflict. So there's a pentarchy. Uh, to use a phrase that the German historian Ranke used in the 19th century, that's a, a very explicit kind of hierarchical order. Uh, I suggest at the end of the book that we ought to learn from that experience and recognize that we already have in place a pentarchy of great powers, which, if they work together, might be able to address some of the problems that we're this about. would be the United States, China, Russia, Russia, Britain and France, the permanent members of the United Nations Security Council, which a body that's generally not been able to do very much certainly wasn't in the Cold War because it was fundamentally divided and the veto power was either being used by the Soviet Union or by the United States. But I think since the Cold War, the possibility that the UN Security Council can work as a, an 1815 to 1914 style pentarchy has arisen. Now, the, the key the issue there... The crisis, and right now that some see opportunity. Well, I think the Russians at the moment are the rogue regime rather than, than the, the member of the club. And the challenge for policy is to bring them on board and make them realize that it is really not in their interests to run with cyber hackers. It's as if I think Putin needs to suffer his own network outage to realize that you can't really make that Faustian pact with the cyber hackers and expect not to fall victim to them yourself one day. They kind of did already with the, when the WannaCry 
uh, malware ran uh, amok. Some of you will know about that. Russian computers were very adversely affected, probably because they hadn't updated their software. Uh, well, it's hard and so it, you know, when what it's goes pirated, around, comes you around. don't update it very Correct. often. Correct. So what goes around comes around, and I do, th I do sense that the notion that you can be a great power that nevertheless steps outside and, and runs with the hackers, that notion may prove to be Putin's ultimate mm. illusion. So this may, this may be a wild uh, pie-in-the-sky kind of recommendation, except that if you look at what's happened with the North Korean missile crisis, which, by the way, is not over, it's very interesting how the UN Security Council has been quite effective over the last year in tightening its, its pressure uh, on North Korea. And that certainly reflects some cooperation between the United States and China, and the Russians have had reluctantly to go along with it. So I see in the international system the potential for at least some kind of hierarchical order, and I certainly don't think that there's a networked alternative to that. Um, natural segue to this question. Your critics have accused you of favoring hierarchies over networks. Is this fair? No. Okay. <laughs> it's actually, <laughs> it's, it, it's funny that. I mean, no, because really the, the book keeps trying to make the point that there's this interplay that, in any case, it's something of a false dichotomy. We really have a continuum which goes from extraordinarily hierarchical structures like Stalin's Soviet Union to very decentralized uh, distributed networks, and you can locate most systems somewhere along that, that spectrum, if you will. And my argument in the book is essentially that we are condemned to struggle with the trade-offs. We want the creativity of the network, that's extraordinarily attractive, but we must be aware of the downside risks. There are a couple we haven't talked about, I'll, I'll identify just one. Networks are very bad at self-defense. The reason that armies are really hierarchical, and anybody who's served in the military, and we are in, in an institution that is uh, connected with the military, knows why. There's a reason that armies are very hierarchical. When it comes to issues of security, a network is really weak. And that, I think, is why for most of human history, it's tended to be hierarchical structures rather than distributed networks that have dominated. I think we saw very clearly in 2016 how easily our political networks got hacked, you know, in, in the case of the Democratic uh, email servers, but also in the case of the Republican campaign. Now, I think that's a very important lesson about the downsides of the, of the network model. And it's nothing new. We can see all kinds of examples, and I give some in the book, of successful attacks on, on networks. The Russians have hacked networks before. They hacked the most exclusive intellectual network in British history, the Apostles, that great Cambridge University intellectual society, got hacked by the Russians in the 1930s so that three of the five Cambridge spies were members of the Apostles. So we've seen this kind of pattern before. I think there's still a failure to recognize that the network is bound to be hacked. If you think that two-factor authentication will save you, I have a bridge to sell you. There's something I could say about Google Cloud and our zero trust security, but we'll leave that for my night um, because there are better ways to do security and it will happen. But what, I hope so. Here's a question. Um, what do you make of fi Facebook's promises to uh, shift the news feed from fake news to more meaningful content? It's important. It will be very interesting to see how big a hit Facebook is prepared to take in terms of lost revenue if they follow through on that. Because if you really do downgrade the, the news media generated content and promote the cat videos from, from your auntie, uh, I'm just not sure that the uh, user engagement is going to be easy to show to the, the people who are buying the advertising. So this is the key issue here. Let's, let's watch what happens. But I welcome the fact that, that uh, Mark Zuckerberg began the year by saying he was going to fix Facebook, and I welcome the fact that he acknowledges that something was broken with the news feed. The importance of the news feed can hardly be overstated for the processes that we talked about, the polarization and the ways in which fake news and extreme views could be promoted. But let's see. I mean, I think it's, a, it's an enormous uh, 
leap of faith to think that self-regulation by big tech companies is going to solve this problem, so long as, as I mentioned earlier, their fundamental incentive must be to continue to sell uh, to sell to advertisers. And moving slightly away from the Valley, we have a question about um, network analysis and artificial intelligence. You mentioned Cambridge, Cambridge Analytica before, um, which is, as I understand it, funded largely by the Mercers, mm. those billionaires. Uh, how it much does it scare you that individuals can control how influential was Cambridge Analytica to begin with, and will we see other sort of new nodes of power that want to control and analyze data this way? It's hard to answer that question. That's a real-time history question. Cambridge Analytica certainly wanted to talk up its role in both Brexit and in Trump's victory. And the evidence such as there is out there is contradictory on how important they really were. My, my sense is that they exaggerated their role and that what really mattered was, in the case of Trump, Pascal's working with Facebook to make that advertising spend very effective. And in the case of, uh, of Brexit, Dominic Cummings, who was the kind of Steve Bannon figure, understanding the same point. Uh, but it's early days. I mean, in truth, the, the full history of the 2016 elections, including the referendum in Britain, will take some time to write because we are only slowly beginning to establish things like that as many people saw Russian content on Facebook and Instagram as voted in the United States, somewhere in the region of 140 to 150 million people. I mean, we did not know that when I was writing the book. That has only recently emerged. Twitter is only now acknowledging the role of Russian bots uh, in, in 2016. So I, I have a sense that there's another inquiry which is going on almost in parallel to the Mueller inquiry, and that is really the inquiry into the role of, the, of, of Silicon Valley in the election. And I, I think that will be, a, in some ways, a more historically important report if it ever if it ever fully emerges. So yeah, I'm, I'm gonna have to reserve judgment on just how important Cambridge Analytica were until we know more. Mm -hmm. uh, a question, how does Britain compare to America in terms of tolerance, discrimination, and freedom of expression? Which is the more tolerant nation? <laughs> well, there are a number of ways you could answer that question. The, uh, the, the legal position is clear the United States has a, a greater legal commitment to free speech. Libel laws scarcely really are an, uh, a phenomenon here, whereas that is not true in, uh, in English law. Uh, so I think there's an important difference there. But then you'd also need to ask a question about attitudes. And on, on the question of attitudes, I think one of the most striking things of, of the last couple of years for me was the realization that the same distinction arose in England as arose in the United States between a metropolitan, educated, cosmopolitan elite attracted to globalization and multiculturalism on the one hand, and a provincial, uh, let's say Middle English or Middle American society that was less educated and distinctly hostile uh, to that elite. And so there's an, an extraordinary similarity in uh, the both sociological and ideological polarization that we've seen in both these English-speaking countries, to the extent that if you paid attention to Brexit, if that's, uh, if that's Mark Zuckerberg... We're, Someone's we're, highly networked out there. Um, you know, if you paid attention to Brexit, you got what was going to happen in the United States. For me, that was a big a learning, a learning moment. Uh, watching those results mm. come in and realizing that the provinces had massively rejected uh, the proposition of European Union membership. And when you look at the people who voted to leave the EU and why they voted for it, it was an uncannily similar to the kind of people who'd voted for Trump and, what, and their reasons for voting for him. So I think there's a great similarity there, uh, which is sometimes obscured in, in discussions of transatlantic difference. Um, in the few minutes we had left, I wanted to get back to the spirit of this as a new way of seeing and a new way of analysis that I, I'm sure you hope will 
have further researchers um, progressing. How has it affected you writing this book? What do you see differently now? And what in your earlier work might you revise with this new prism? I think that work of revision's already begun. I, I had written about networks, but without understanding the importance of analyzing network structure. That was true in the case of the book I wrote on the Rothschild uh, family and work that I did later on financial history. I think if I can achieve one other thing with this book besides giving Silicon Valley its history lesson, I would love to give the historical profession a proper grounding in network science because the potential of these tools is enormous and it's only really just begun to be used by scholars of the past. Terrific work, as I think I mentioned, on the Enlightenment. Colleagues at Stanford have pioneered this uh, with the Republic of Letters project. But there's much less work on the great and uh, history-making phenomena of the 20th century. We don't have good social network analysis of the Nazi party. So we don't understand the structure of the movement that brought the most terrible dictator to power in all history. We don't really understand the Bolshevik party, which transformed itself from a network into a hierarchy with amazing speed as soon as the civil war had been won. So I hope that I've got, I can get historians to see that this is a really powerful way of thinking about the past. And until you know the structure of the network, you don't really know why the great man looked so great. Mm. And 10 years ago, 15 years ago, you were a great champion of perhaps the strongest tower of them all, the British Empire in the 19th century. And we're urging the United States to look to that and that long-term commitment deeply. Is that possible in today's networked world? That's a bit of a caricature of what I wrote. Uh, though well, it must we don't have a lot of time. <laughs> it's, been, it's the kind of Twitter version, of the 140 characters version. What I actually said was, hey, the British Empire was, uh, had costs and it had benefits, and we should acknowledge uh, both if we're to understand it. Uh, secondly, any attempt by the United States to replicate the model of liberal empire that emerged in the 19th and early 20th century is likely to fail. That was the argument of but the But you did Colossus. speak to the commitment to, to stay out in these places for a long time. The argument I made was that if you really want to try to transform societies like Iraq's and Afghanistan's into something that resembles uh, our own society with liberal institutions and the rule of law, don't expect it to be done inside a four-year election cycle. And I was dead right about that. Yeah. I do wish, I do wish <laughs> people point. would stop misrepresenting those books. Uh, but then that, it seems to be, illustrates precisely the, the point that we're making. You write books and you end up with your argument, arguments caricatured in tweets. It's the fate of the public intellectual today. I can tell you it's not a happy fate. <laughs> It was actually the New York Times article I read, and I'll revisit it tonight. Our thanks to Neil Ferguson for joining us this evening at the Commonwealth Club. Thank you. We'd like to remind our audience in the room that copies of Neil's excellent book, The Square and the Tower, Networks, Power, From the Freemasons to Facebook, are available for purchase, and he will be happy to sign your copy for you on stage in just a minute. We also want to thank Jackson Square Partners for generously supporting tonight's program. I'm Quentin Hardy, and now, this meeting of the Commonwealth Club of California, the place where you're in the know, is adjourned. <laughs>